Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, on behalf of Dartmouth Library, I would like to welcome all of you to our second virtual book talk, The 60-Year Curriculum, New Models for Lifelong Learning in the Digital Economy. Uh, James Honan, Senior Lecturer on Education at uh, HTSC, will briefly introduce everyone else before we begin our discussion. Jim, you can take it from here. Thank you, Mayan. Thanks for all of your help. Thanks to Alex Hodges also from Gutland Library for hosting us. Thanks to all of you for taking the time to be here. Um, delighted that you have chosen to take some time to hear about this book on the 60-year curriculum. Um, in addition to uh, being a chapter author, I'm a colleague of our, our group here today and I'm delighted to be with them. So in a minute, you're gonna hear from our two co-editors, Chris Deedy faculty member at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and John Richards, also at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And we're to be delighted, uh, we're delighted to be joined by Henry Leitner. He's from the Harvard Extension School, and uh, he's also a chapter author. So Chris and John, you'll take the lead, and Henry and I will be discussants and commentators following through. So many thanks to all, and welcome. Well, Jim, thank you. Um, the game plan is that John and I will discuss the book, and then um, Jim and Henry will provide both uh, commentary on what we said and also extend by talking about ideas from their chapters. And um, then we'll throw it open for general question and answer. Chris, now, one second. Uh, Mayan, uh, the participant screen sharing is disabled. Can you enable it, please? Sure, just one second. I think you should be able to do it right now. Great, so here is our, uh, the start of our PowerPoint. Um, so we ask that you put your questions into the chat uh, throughout uh, the four of us talking, and then at the end, we'll be able to pick and choose from some questions that appeared. And in addition, we're happy to follow through with you afterwards. Next slide, please. So I'm going to discuss the rationale or why we're talking about reconceptualizing lifelong learning, which then involves reconceptualizing both continuing education and higher education. And the place to start is with lifespan, The children born now are typically going to live until age 90 or beyond. So they're gonna to have to work about six decades to cover their retirement. And this is going to be a particularly turbulent and disruptive 60 year period that we're facing. Um, we're already seeing the effects of climate change. This slide was written before the pandemic, but we have an unexpected pandemic. It's clear that the world is going to fail to meet the UN sustainability goals. And as I'll talk about more in a minute, we see a lot of shifts coming in the division of labor between people and machines. At the same time, there's just a lot of breakthroughs coming in many different technological fields that have the potential to reshape the nature of work and the nature of citizenship. And all of that is happening at a time when billions of people are connected by mobile devices and, and through social media. And as a result, the pace of change is driven much more rapidly than it was historically. So people starting work now are facing something that might be comparable roughly to the period between 1910 and 1960. People wrote about the greatest generation, two world wars, a pandemic, uh, the emergence of, of competition between capitalism and communism was a very, very challenging time. It, everything appeared that that's going to be true in the next half century. And the introductory chapter to the book, which I wrote 
um, describes a whole series of about 30 reports that all come to the same conclusion about that. I'm happy to share that chapter with any of you who are interested. Next slide. Um, in particular, uh, one of the kinds of disruption that's going to have the most impact on continuing in higher education is, is the potential of advances in artificial intelligence and machine learning to change the nature of work. Now, there are relatively few occupations that will be totally disappearing because of a new division of labor between people and machines, but there are a lot of occupations, including many that you might not think would be vulnerable, in which the nature of the human role will change fundamentally because the machine is taking over a lot of that role. And so upskilling is going to be very important. And um, one way to think about that is that whether or not people have five to seven careers that are totally different careers, occupations may change so much that it will be like having a different career. So when I advise my students at HGSE and they come in and they say, I, I really don't know. I, I, part of me wants to be a designer. Part of me wants to be an evaluator. I say, well, you're going to be both. And you're going to be three or four other things that neither you nor I know what they are right now. So the real question to ask is not which of the two, but which would be the best place to start. And that really puts it into the lifelong learning context. Next slide. Now, this is also true, of course, for faculty. We are part of the um, professions that are going to see a new division of labor. You know, one of the contributors to our prior book on learning engineering was Ashok Goal at Georgia Tech University. He is developing a whole set of AI-based assistants that will take over uh, much of what teaching assistants do, which in turn enables professors and the instructional staff to go deeper. But you can only go deeper if you've been prepared to go deeper. So just as we will deepen the knowledge and skills we attempt to give our students when AI is able to take over some of the routine parts of that, workers across the board on that last slide if they are upskilled, can do IA, intelligence augmentation. But if they're not upskilled, it's going to be all AI and they're going to end up working for machines. So that's a pretty stark choice and one of the reasons that we are part of the 60-year curriculum initiative. John, over to you. So as Chris pointed out, and uh, it was interesting in the first, in the second two chapters done by economists, what we're looking at are changes in the environment, in globalization, human longevity. Oh, that's a frisky one. And uh, the technical digitalization, and it's digitalization, not just di di digitization. Digitization is turning what we have and making it digital, but digitalization is actually involving re-engineering and rethinking the processes. And the question is, how does this impact the university? How does the university adapt and modify what it's doing so that it can accommodate all of these changes? So in fact, that is the positioning of the book. In the one career world, pre-career, you'd go through a two to four year college, you'd get some get a, a master's or a PhD. And then there's a series of items that go on for the rest of your career, whether it begins with a professional certification or professional development, job training, and the, the role of the university is to offer a flow from the pre-career through graduation. And coaching occurs during that time. 
But once you enter your career, the university drops off with perhaps one exception. Jim, do you want to talk about executive coaching? Thank you, John. Happy to say a word about this. And Henry, you may have some ideas as well. So you'll notice on this slide to the far right under lifetime career, the acronym IEM. And my chapter in this book focused on an institute that I have been a faculty chair for quite some time at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, the Institute for Educational Management. And my charge from Chris and John was to look at university-based executive education programs and their place in the 60-year curriculum. So we'll come back to that later, but I think building on your good point, John, sometimes universities are involved at the later stages in the 60-year curriculum and this institute that I work with for senior college and university administrators, as you can see here, comes later in the 60-year curriculum, and uh, the university has a role. Thank you, John. So now what we're looking at is pre-career, career one, career two, career three, and it goes on. And the challenge is how do we purposefully offer the flow from a pre-career through a retirement? And how do we think about 60-year coaching? So how does the university with approach a, a, a person that comes in at 16, 17, 18, and is going to dip in at various points in their set of careers to access the university? And how can the, the university create a meaningful learning experience over this time? So let's take a look at the typical university today is one career. It's designed to provide uh, support for that lifetime career. And as we saw, you have your professional certification, professional development, and then you leave with a series of, oh, a series of skills. You have a, a whole lot of knowledge about that first career, but what happens when that first career is interrupted with a second career? How do you bring those skills in? How does a university start thinking about that so that when we provide uh, certification for a second career, when we're providing additional professional development, perhaps a, sec uh, a master's or on-the-job training? And the challenge is, how do you provide that continuity from career one to career two? If a person was an accountant and AI has gotten rid of their job and they now want to teach high school math, how do they prepare for that? How do they get guidance? 60 years of coaching. The people that they knew in the university that prepared them for accounting don't know anything more about high school math teaching than does the, the candidate. So we have to be able to figure out a way to track an individual and to support them in these career switches. And the challenge for the university is what is the role of the higher ed institution through these 60 years? How does the higher ed institution determine which segment of learners it can serve and what services they need? In particular, what does purposefully offer the flow mean? It means that we have to think about a curriculum to support transitions, a 60-year curriculum. And what that means in this regard is we have to prepare a student for a lifelong series of careers. They need to have the kind of adaptability that will enable them to move from career to career, to excel in a succession of professional opportunities, and to engage in post-career activities. And John, to build on, on that, can you go back for just a second? To build on that, 
Um, we don't ordinarily think about inculcating dispositions. We think about knowledge and skills, and that's what you need to have an occupation. But when you're thinking across the full lifelong learning spectrum at a very disruptive time, the dispositions become a very important part of what's inculcated. And flexibility, resilience, self-efficacy and confidence, initiative and entrepreneurship, the list can go on and on. These may be as important or even more important than some specific set of knowledge and skills. Next slide. So a report from the National Research Council came out uh, eight years ago and it divided um, different kinds of advanced knowledge and skills into three buckets. The cognitive, which we're all quite familiar with, interpersonal, which is the psychosocial, and then intrapersonal, which is more the dispositions that I just talked about. And it's interesting to take something like a master's program or like a doctoral program or like an undergraduate degree and to look at the range of things that should be encompassed according to the National Research Council and how much emphasis is put within the experiences we give those students across this range. And typically when people do this exercise for whatever pro academic program they're involved with, it's very uneven and there are important boxes that are not given much weight. And then if we ask, well, what's assessed? The situation is even worse because many of these things are notoriously difficult to measure. So in a way, what the book is about is stepping back and asking, what business are we in? Uh, Newport, Rhode Island is one of my favorite places to visit. It's got these great mansions that were built during the Gilded Age. And many of those fortunes came from the railroads. But almost before the mansions were finished, there was a collapse in terms of the railroad fortunes. And the reason is that the railroads thought they were in the railroad business, but they're actually in the transportation business. And so the automobile and the airplane hammered the railroads. In the same way, are we in the degree business or the course business? Are we really in the education business? I think, and the book argues, that we're in the learning business. And when you frame it that way, then a lot of the issues that John is raising and that our chapter authors raise are about not just how you, do you deliver education, but how do you prepare people to be continuously learning and transforming their nature over these six decades. Next slide. John, this is you. So in the past, we had an, the old factory model of schools and where uh, students were being processed uh, in, into a, in a, as if in a warehouse and information learning was an information transfer and then we moved in the in the 80s to start thinking about uh the office model of uh education and and it was an information processing era and we thought about thinking skills but today the big change that's occurred and that has guided us and that i talk about in the final chapter of the book is that we're living in a network age and the nature of work really is in this gig economy, consulting and entrepreneurship and the cognitive model becomes an agile network. And we're thinking about learning as being transferable skills. And what we're thinking about for a university is to start supporting this model of education. And it's something that within a university is very new and something that faculty members who are, who were mostly in the factory or office model are trying to 
make sure their content gets across. They're not thinking about how do we move to an entrepreneurial model? How do we move, how do we support students to become consultants, to become successful in a, in a gig economy, to move from one career to another? So part of what we now have is we're facing a series of what we think of as applied research questions. What will transfer from the first career? How will universities teach social emotional learning? This is something we've begun doing in the K-12 world, but universities have not touched this in any way. How will universities develop executive function skills? And what do mid-career transitions look like? These are applied research. It's not basic research. We have to take information from this and bring it into what we're doing while we're doing it. So as, as the Division of Continuing Education is supporting students in their transitions, we have to be able to figure out the answers to these kinds of questions so that DCE can modify the courses that they're actually teaching. Uh, Henry, do you want to talk a little bit about how this has, the 60-year the curriculum has impacted DCE? Sure. So, yeah, I'm, I'm representing the, the division of continuing it, not just uh, Harvard Extension School, which is one major branch of the division of continuing it. And uh, perhaps some of you don't realize that aside from what the division is able uh, to offer, Harvard University as a whole today has way more part-time adult learners participating in various programs than it has residential students in the various colleges and professional schools. So during my time at DCE, I have, just, I have been witness to our creating and currently offering what I see as key components of a 60-year curriculum right now. We have a very extensive range of courses. In other words, part-time adult learners and others can come and take one or two courses. We have degree opportunities, undergraduate degree opportunities, degree completion opportunities, graduate degree opportunities, certificate programs, uh, executive education, some of that not for credit. Uh, we have study groups, which uh, mostly works uh, in the area of the retirement years. So we're actually serving high school students, degree completers, mid-career professionals, and retirees. And what we're doing at DC is trying to reduce, I guess, some of the conflicting features among the individual curricula so that there's more consistency among the courses and among the programs. What, what we haven't quite gotten to yet, uh, as I would like to see it, is the advising piece. Because as somebody is interested in moving on to a new career, they need I mean, we have some of it in place, but they need more high quality kinds of coaching and mentoring uh, to help people make dis wise decisions about courses or certificates or whatever you know, it is that we're offering. So the numbers of, just to give you a sense, we have a gigantic uh, enrollment these days. In fact, I'm very pleased to tell those of you who don't know that uh, our summer school, which starts today, uh, traditionally has a major residential component to it, largely for uh, pre-college students, high school students, and others. And of course, we're completely online. We made that decision very late. And yet our enrollments are up 17%. In fact, we have a record number of students and enrollments. We have more than 10,000 students, uh, almost 14,000 enrollments, and it's all online serving this wide range of individuals from you know, folks who are not yet in a college from people who are already matriculated in a college and everybody else in between. So let's just give you a sense of, of where DCE is situated within this. Back to you guys. Chris? And Henry, I want you to know I'm helping to support DCE because my younger daughter is one of those students who is starting her statistics class tomorrow morning. And you did so, ask for a scholarship? My goodness. <laughs> I did not, I did not. We're paying full freight. So 
the book isn't simply about framing the problem, even though what we've largely done in this presentation is to frame the problem and, and why it is a major challenge and opportunity. Most of the chapters in the book are in fact about next steps. Most of the chapters in the book, including the ones that Jim and Henry did, are about uh, models that are emerging now uh, largely out of continuing education, but not exclusively, that are illustrating what uh, the answers to these questions might be, at least in the early stages. And so uh, the book is providing a way that people doing this early work can dialogue with each other, can exchange solutions with each other, and so on. Next slide. There's just one more thing I want to mention, and then uh, we can shift over to discussion by Jim and, and by Henry. Um, the prior book before this one uh, involved many of the same participants in a workshop the year before. It was about a concept that Herb Simon um, at Carnegie Institute of Technology uh, developed over half a century ago, which was the concept of learning engineers that could uh, engineer learning so that it's successively improved over time. Next slide. And that book uh, actually provides a foundation on which we were able to build this book. And a lot of what DCE is doing now comes into this category of engineering learning so that the courses are are successfully getting better and better and better. Next slide. So as a researcher, I'm excited about this because the opportunity to work with data at the scale that Henry is describing and that's taking place now all across higher education because everyone has been forced into a situation of remote learning is tremendously exciting. Um, the microscope is an example of how data had always been there, but we didn't know how to collect it. When we collected it, we didn't know how to analyze it. And when we finally figured out how to analyze it, it changed everything. The theory of disease as microbial came from the microscope. Telescope, same story. Data always there, didn't know how to collect it, didn't know how to analyze it. Now that's changing everything in terms of how we think about the universe. We have now the equivalent of the microscope and the telescope for learning in the kinds of data streams that are being collected, not just in MOOCs anymore or distance education, but in all forms of education. And it's very exciting to think about the scientific insights that that may lead to in terms of changing everything in terms of how we think about learning. So I hope we've communicated some sense of our excitement about the book. Next slide. And I'd like to turn it over to, to Jim and Henry both to provide any commentary they have on how we framed it, but also to talk about anything they want to add about their specific chapters. So let me, I'll just weigh in uh, a little bit about the learning engineering uh, ideas that you were uh, pointing out just a moment ago. So one of, one of the most important premises is, as those of you who are educators or just people who participate in education know, which is that it doesn't matter how great your curriculum looks or how great you think your pedagogy is, that really lacks value if there are a lot of learners who don't finish their courses or their degrees or somehow they fail to achieve, you know, their reskilling or career changing objectives. So now that, you know, regardless of whether a course is meeting face to face in a classroom or whether it's meeting exclusively online, students virtually everywhere are utilizing learning management systems, whether it's Canvas or something else. So as Chris was pointing out, we have all of this clickstream data. We know when students submitted their work, we know uh, who's procrastinating, we know uh, how much students are actually uh, utilizing the resources within the, uh, the course website and so on. So what we are trying, what we have done actually is we've built a, uh, 
a beta version of what we're calling is a uh, sort of a dashboard that would indicate to faculty and their teaching staff uh, who is most at risk. Because if one were to simply graphically show those students who perhaps are achieving poor grades on assignments, on exams, uh, who are turning work in late habitually, who are not actually coming to class, perhaps who are not participating in a web conference uh, or in any of the other course activities, this data is now being harnessed and is being presented, as I said, in a very, what I think is a useful graphical form so that if you look at the individual at the top, they seem to be most at risk of doing badly because as a, somebody who's been teaching for a long time, I always find it very frustrating that we don't realize very often who is floundering until it's almost too late to help some of them. Uh, so the idea is that early and often you want to have intervention. You want to have, you know, perhaps if it's a large course, the teaching assistant or teaching fellow taking students aside and uh, maybe it's just a conversation or maybe it's some, you know, conceptual gap that they are having. Maybe they didn't, you know, remember the relevant linear algebra that they needed to work on the current problem set. But it's important to have that kind of uh, human mentorship and human conversation in order to achieve greater uh, degrees of outcomes in our courses. So that's where I get very excited about the learning engineering possibilities within the larger 60 year curriculum. Henry, while you have the floor, there was a terrific question on the chat function. I'll read it. It sounds like Harvard's DCE is already primed and doing a 60 year curriculum. How can the rest of Harvard push DCE as a component of the university that is already ready for the future? Yeah, that, that is an interesting question. So uh, there is movement. Be, before the pandemic hit, uh, Larry Backow, the president of, the, of Harvard, uh, convened a group on workforce and upskilling, uh, bringing in representatives from each of the schools at Harvard to answer some of those very basic questions. They didn't refer to it as a 60 year curriculum, but they were looking at some of the important uh, ideas that Chris and John were talking about in framing the discussion about the 60 year curriculum. So we met as a group, there were representatives, as I said, from each of the schools at Harvard, and I represented DCE. There were representatives from uh, state government and from the federal government. And we actually have a pretty much penultimate draft of a paper that uh, is looking at what Harvard uh, and its entirety can do. I will find out at one point I can share that document with any of you who are interested. And ultimately it's gonna be up to the president and the provost to decide how to move forward. But we are, you know, it's sort of a, I sort of mixed feelings about uh, some of the conclusions, which is, you know, Harvard is a research institution. And what we don't want is just to have recommendation that say, we're going to keep studying the issues and the problems without actually, you know, taking concrete action. But it's a, it's a multifaceted document and it's, it's very well written. And uh, so just to basically summarize, the, the university is looking at uh, many aspects of the 60 year, -year, -year curriculum. Chris and John, can I build on that question with a couple others on Henry's point? There was a great a, a, a twofer question. One is, are there things as the three of you see this 60 year curriculum that universities are not equipped to do or not their role to play? And to flip it, do you see the role of other non-university entities such as examples, apprenticeship academies or coaching by seasoned executives in a non-university way. So I guess the question to the three of you, and it builds on your point, Henry, and your conversation about DCE, where are the roles of universities and any places where you don't see universities playing a role in the 60-year curriculum? So I'll, I'll, I'll tackle some of that. Part of, part of the idea of what business are you in is that we're in a service business that might have a suite of providers associated with it rather than a single provider. So sometimes you might come to a more traditional higher education institution to get something that was akin to a formal course. Other times you might go to a division of continuing education to get something that might be closer to a micro credential. But sometimes you might be involved in say a mentoring and coaching service that might come neither from the university nor from 
a division of continuing education and instead would would center on on lifetime uh, career development in the same way that you might have a bank that you work with for your money matters and you might have a stockbroker you work with for your money matters but you also might have a financial advisor who, who provides an umbrella over everything and integrates everything and those right now are missing pieces within higher education those services uh, don't don't really exist in the context of lifelong learning one of the ways that the university and its relationship to the student had been defined was through residence. And what we're now looking at because of online education is that residence doesn't need to be there over the course of the career. And the question is when a student goes through four, two or four or six or eight years, why do they have to leave that environment completely as opposed to being able to tap back in to the resources and to keep that relationship to be something more than uh, football games and alumni uh, meetings and donations. Uh, but what we're really looking for is the ability to transform the university to start thinking differently about its relationship with the student. Because the one career university prepares somebody for one career, and now they have to start realizing that that isn't going to be appropriate. And that means that the university itself has to begin rethinking its nature and its purpose. And to me, that means that we're not, we don't have to go to some third party that we don't yet know, but rather think about transformation of the university to be able to support more of the gig economy, more of the consultant role, more of the transition from career to career. I'll just weigh in quickly. There's a natural tension between a university wanting to offer courses that have uh, sort of academic credit that are worthy of academic credit as opposed to just teaching skills, right? There are, we get course proposals from individuals who want to teach the latest Microsoft or Google technology, but it's, you know, those courses tend to be very limited in scope and very specific to, you know, those technologies when there are outside providers who do a very, very good job of, you know, uh, educating people who need that, those specific set of skills. So uh, very often, at least from where I sit within the university, we don't, or we tend not to offer those sorts of courses, which might be very valuable for individuals in particular fields. So to build on that, there's a question about, for universities who are interested in starting this journey toward a 60 year curriculum, where do you start? Do you look at degrees, courses, majors, et cetera? And what's the role of partners, government, industries, et cetera? I don't know, Chris, if you want to take that one. Well, I'll start, but I hope that they'll all comment on it. I, I think that what, to respond to what Henry just said and build on it, um, what's missing in a lot of the boot camp types of programs that give students a highly specific set of skills that might help with their immediate employment is that three years later, they're back in another boot camp because the skills were so narrow that they were brittle. The world keeps being disrupted and turbulent and, and, and you're starting over again in terms of reskilling. But upskilling, which is closer to what deeper courses do does involve developing a larger framework. So you don't just understand a particular tool, you understand the ways in which that tool draws on different kinds of functions so that if you come up later using a different tool, you're not starting over again from scratch. And we're suggesting in the book that it also starts to get into dispositions, which is something that typically is not part of the instructional objectives and courses. It's not something that faculty are consciously thinking about. And yet, um, it's, it's going to need to be much more of a sense in the future because the dialogue with a student can't be anymore, pay us some money 
and will help you with the, with, to get a job. It's, it's going to have to be, let's work together over an extended period of time to help you reach your full human capacity, uh, both for your life and your contribution to society. One of the things that we came to in the book, and it's there in multiple chapters, is the issue of transfer. We, we have found over time that transfer of learning from one context to another rarely happens. And so when we're talking about someone moving from one career to another, and that requires some transfer, what is it that we have to start thinking about? And the notion of transfer only happens when someone has a deep knowledge of the first area and is supported in that transfer. So in fact, when you have a career professional who has done well in one career and has progressed and has deep knowledge of that career, now we have something to work with to transfer to a second career. But no courses are really constructed that way and no um, advising and coaching and mentoring has been developed to take care of it. So to me, one of the critical aspects, and Henry mentioned this, but it, it was absolutely critical, is to begin to understand the mentoring, coaching aspect and to start thinking about the, the curriculum and the word curriculum in 60 year curriculum was was quite purposeful we have to design something that moves between content areas and that to me will support the kind of flexibility that transfer will require and that career shifts will require yeah let me i'll just add to uh what you were saying with a very specific example that i'm very proud of. It's a part of the Harvard Summer School. It's called the Crimson, the Crimson Summer Academy. And what it does is over the course of three consecutive summers, we get 30 students from public schools in Boston, Cambridge, and Somerville, uh, many of them from very disadvantaged neighborhoods. And they engage in a stimulating mix of classes and projects and cultural activities as a way of preparing them for success in college and beyond. And many of these are the so-called high, are the high at risk students who, many of whom perhaps were not even contemplating college. And so through small group instruction and close mentoring relationships with Harvard undergrads, they come to the summer school. Uh, we're actually very fortunate to give them uh, all scholarships. They take these intensive courses, but then they remain in contact with their Harvard undergraduate mentors as they go back to their local high schools during the regular school year. And amazingly, something like, I don't know the exact number, 94 or 95% of these students who go through the three years actually uh, go to college and graduate from college. Some of them even are admitted to Harvard College. So it's this, then it doesn't have to be Harvard undergrads, of course, they're paired up with. This is the sort of thing that could be done at any university that would like to do it, because the model has been proven. It's been around now for 10 years. Uh, I'm sorry that it only takes in 30 students a year because it's, it's really a brilliantly proven example of how the power of mentorship can lead students who are at risk to great success. Thanks so much. Um, Chris, actually to the three of you, a question about, we call it the 60 year curriculum, but a little bit of a question about the journey and the pathway on a more personal level. What does that look like, those various transitions and moves across the uh, lifespan? Well, I think part of what we talk about in the book is not defining yourself in terms of a career or an occupation but defining yourself in terms of a suite of knowledge and skills. Because people often find it very wrenching when they make a career change, especially if it's an involuntary career change driven by turbulence and disruption, as so many people are facing right now because of the pandemic, when your identity is somehow associated with that career. 
And in contrast, if I don't think of myself as a faculty member, so that if somehow tomorrow morning, uh, someone would wipe out Harvard's endowment and I would be out on the streets and I'd have to try to find another job as a faculty member. If I instead think of myself as a suite of knowledge and skills, that I'm good at explaining complicated things to a wide variety of people in an understandable way, that I'm good at uh, listening and, and providing advice and mentoring, that I have a lot of social capital and I can reach out uh, to people and, and hook them up together in order to accomplish things. When you describe it that way, there's a much broader range of things that I could do than simply thinking of myself as a faculty member and helping our students to define themselves in that way so that these shifts are not so wrenching, I think is part of the issue. In the slide, that I'm sorry, Jim. Go ahead, John. In the slide that, that Chris showed, where we have cognitive outcomes, intrapersonal outcomes, and interpersonal outcomes, these are three categories of skills and uh, competencies that people have. And most people discount the intrapersonal and interpersonal. They think of university as just providing the cognitive outcomes. But most of what will account for success in multiple careers is the intrapersonal and interpersonal skills and competencies. And, ha and when you do an inventory of those, you often come out in a very different place than when you're looking at what you know and what your cognitive outcomes are. And that is something that people have begun to look at so that where you do an inventory and then look at what kinds of jobs and careers could you now pursue. Henry, a thought on that, the journeys across the uh, learning lifespan? You see it all the time, I bet, in your work. Yeah, no, no, of course we do. But I, 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 just to circle back to a point I was making earlier, I think the, the kind of coaching that's needed, for example, uh, somebody just asked a question in the chat about how people who step off the career track for a few years for personal reasons, whether it's parental obligations or health issues, uh, can be somehow, you know, restarted uh, in an effective way. And I think for that, there still needs to be uh, a much better, higher level of of coaching for adult learners than we currently have today. You know, I refer to the Crimson Summer Academy, but that's, you know, they were dealing with high school students and it's working well for that, you know, particular type of cohort, but we don't yet have it, I don't think, for the, uh, at least in, in what we're doing at DCE. Nobody else, actually, I was surprised nobody's asked about the role of MOOCs in all of this. Uh, I mean, I have my own personal opinion, but I'd be curious to hear what the rest of you think about whether MOOCs can serve a useful purpose in the, 60-year curriculum. So I'll throw a question out to the, those of you who were here. <laughs> yeah. Henry, can I build on that? Because there were a, yeah. a question embedded in that one. One was yeah. a question of scale. It yeah. does the 60-year curriculum scale MOOCs as an example of potentially scalable. And the other question I'm watching our time to are about the costs and affordability of the 60-year curriculum and its stages. So build on Henry's question, whether it's MOOCs, scale, or affordability and cost, how do we do this? Well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the cost and affordability because one of the things that we discuss in different points in the book is what kinds of different public policies might be needed if we shift towards a lifelong learning conception of educational investment rather than just a schooling um, conception. And Right now, we have unemployment insurance, and we see massive numbers of people going on to unemployment insurance, and there's nothing about that that's very helpful for them other than the money, because the conception is that they're just using that until they can go back to the same job. Um, one of the proposals in, that's emerged that we discuss in the book is instead of having employability insurance, and the idea is that you receive money throughout your lifespan 
to keep employable by keep up upskilling in different ways so that you're not just locked into a single uh, job and only able to get help when you lose the job, which is kind of too late in a way, but to be able to invest in yourself. And that kind of investment, there's a very good economic case for. Affordability and scale, Henry or John? Well, I'll, I'll just, I'll just, one observation. I've discovered, I've, I've been involved with the Harvard X, a uh, part of edX since the beginning. And, uh, you know, I, you know, there's a very, as you all know, there's a very high non-completion rate in MOOCs. And you will also see that to some extent in DCE courses where students are not putting so-called financial skin into the game. So uh, to be more concrete, Harvard employees get to take DCE courses basically for free. And because they're not paying, because they're not required to, you know, to get a, you know, a grade of B or whatever it is, uh, we find that a lot of them are taking up space in these courses, but then disappearing. They're not completing the course, just as in the case of MOOCs, there's a, you know, some the extreme example is we have an introductory course at Harvard called CS50. It's had 2 million people enroll over the last few years and fewer than 1% of the students get through it. And again, you know, it could be that many of those learners just wanted to, you know, take a tiny piece of it and, and they were happy with that. But what we see is that, I mean, and I know I myself have signed up for a number of MOOCs and not even logged in because, you know, real life gets in the way. There's something about, you know, putting that skin into the game so that you feel obligated and uh, more motivated than you might otherwise if you're just getting a grant and there's no consequence for not finishing the course. That's at least my observation. Thank you all. I think we got all of the questions off of the chat function. Thanks to all of you to posing them. And I guess back to Chris and John in our final moments for a final word with thanks. I, I just want to say that this has not ended with the publication of the book, that uh, we are continuing to work with with DC here at Harvard, we're continuing to work with other continuing education groups and higher education groups across the country and even across the world to look at how we reconceptualize lifelong learning. And if this is an initiative that you'd like to be part of, we hope that you'll reach out to us because we're happy to have some fellow travelers in the journey. John, maybe say a word or two about the structured interviewing uh research that we're going to be embarking on. You're muted, you're, you're muted. muted, you're muted. Always. Uh, to follow up on the uh, applied research notion, uh, we have begun the process of interviewing uh, current and former students from DCE to find out to actually begin to get answers to the questions that we were asking before and to also interview some employers. So we really want to go deeper into how you leverage the skills that people have, what is their motivation, how do we support that? And again, this kind of applied research will be providing guidance back to DCE and uh, what they're doing. Uh, I should also, I just wanted to mention, there were two questions in the Q&A uh, box, not the chat box, both of which sort of struck on the, the theme of how can, uh, if we're going to be replacing workers by automation, what is our obligation to begin thinking differently about changing society to support the kinds of people who are struggling and whose work may in fact become uh, unnecessary and, uh, and, and replaced by machines. And to me, that is a critical question. And I think it's uh, interestingly, the uh, two economists that we um, worked with in the, first, in the second and third chapter both attempted to address that. Uh, so I think it's, it is a critical question, 
and uh, it's not that we're trying to live with the system as it is, but I think we, we tried to look at how changes in a university can support people where they are. I believe we are right near time. Uh, thank you to John, thank you to Chris. Henry has had to go to another event, but we thank Henry as well. And Mayan, back to you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks all.